Thank you, Bill. Uh, so hello, everybody. I'm going to talk for a little bit, and then I'll hand it back over to Bill and Roseanne. Uh, my name is Katie, and with me today is my colleague, Marge. We want to thank you for joining us tonight on Zoom. Um, Marge is responsible for all of the tech stuff at Lyon Township Public Library. So if, if you're not familiar with us, um, I do marketing and adult services and she does all of the tech stuff. So we're really grateful to have her. Um, we're super pleased to be hosting our speakers tonight. So I, would, I definitely want to thank Bill and Roseanne for taking time out of their day to be with us. Before I introduce him and Roseanne, I just want to touch on a little bit of housekeeping. So tonight's program is going to be recorded and it will be available on our YouTube channel and Facebook after tonight. All audience members will be muted and uh, throughout the duration of tonight's talk, unless Bill calls on somebody. Uh, the chat function is available for asking questions at any time, either to our guest speakers or to LTPL staff. Marge and I will be monitoring it. Please keep respectful in your communications in the chat and anything considered disruptive or counterproductive may result in removal. I just wanted to let you know that. Bill and Roseanne will answer questions posed in the chat from the audience throughout the presentation when they take the breaks. Um, next, we want to thank all of you for your continued support of public libraries during this time. Our communities benefit from the shared resources that libraries provide in person and online. And we're thankful for all of our friend libraries that shared this presentation with you, especially if you're not from Michigan, so thanks. We'd like to welcome you to join us for our first ever virtual book club meeting, and that's tomorrow at 7 p.m. Registration is required and can be found on our website at ltpl.org in the event calendar. And Marge will also be one of the moderators for the book club too, so you'll see her there as well. Lastly, we'd like to encourage you to join us for our annual summer reading program. Registration details will be announced very soon, so stay tuned. And we'll be introducing an online reading tracking system called Read Squared, along with alternative means of participating and our summer will also be full of fun events for all ages so we hope to see you throughout the summer uh, and just in case i just want to let you know if we do experience any disruptions just to bear with us uh, if we have to do some troubleshooting it's our very first virtual program we're very excited to be here doing this so thanks so much for your patience in advance now I would like to introduce our speaker, Bill Rapai, award-winning reporter and editor in the past, current president of the Gross Point Audubon Society, and published author of three nonfiction books, including 2013 Michigan notable book, The Kirtland's Warbler. And I'll turn it over to you, Bill. Thank you so much. Thank you. So Marge, I need you to uh, enable the uh, screen share so I can uh, take, the, uh, take control of the screen there. Okay. And um, say when. Actually, hold on just a second here. I did the wrong button. Hold on. No worries. Uh, there we go. You got it? I got it. There it is. All right. So, um, good evening, and thank you very much for joining us. Um, once again, my name is Bill Rapay. I'm president of the Point Audubon Society, and joining me this evening is my friend, Roseanne Kowalczyk. I'll let Roseanne in, 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 um, introduce herself while I go close the window because somebody's mowing the lawn nearby. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Roseanne Kowalczyk, and I've been birding for a really long time, ever since I was a teenager. I own the Wild Birds Unlimited store in Gross Point Woods, and I am also on the board of directors of Michigan Audubon and Detroit Audubon. So lifelong lover of birds and here to share that passion. So um, birding, as you probably have, have heard by now, because everybody's kind of talking about birds, uh, birding is having a moment because we're all kind of stuck. Thank goodness the, the governor um, eased some of the uh, restrictions today, but uh, up until 
just recently, um, people have been kind of looking around for things to do, and a lot of people have turned to birding, including the New York Times, which you can see right there. They had a big article on their op-ed page uh, in early May about how uh, to go about watching birds. And it's the perfect uh, activity to do while social distancing because you can do it from your backyard. You can do it while you're uh, uh, on a walk or in the local city park, maintaining your social distancing, of course. And it's a great way to relieve stress. Believe me, when I'm sitting behind the computer working, uh, writing whatever, uh, I spend five minutes looking out the window at the, at the birds and it helps me refocus and it really brings me a lot of joy. So we'll talk a little bit about uh, some definitions about uh, what migration is. Um, and we'll talk about how migration happens in a pattern, uh, what birds you're likely to see during migration, because uh, even though we all tend to see the same birds over and over and over again, if we look a little bit harder, we're going to see some incredible birds out there. Uh, I will talk about how you can attract birds to your yard, and it's really some very, very simple things that you can do to, to bring different birds to your yard, and how technology helps us understand how birds migrate. First, uh, let's do a little definition. This is a bird. All right, program over. Good night, everybody. <laughs> oh, I'm getting the evil eye from uh, Katie, so I guess we have to continue. Um, so there are different patterns for different types of birds. There are your resident birds, like your cardinals and black-capped chickadees, that are here all year round. You, you, the ones that you see in the winter are the same ones that are here during the summer, as opposed to resident migrants, like blue jays and, and um, gold, American goldfinches, which are uh, here all year round. But the birds that you see in the winter are not necessarily the ones that you see during the summer. They shift range. Short-range migrants, like a common grackle, um, they fly in from places in Ohio and Kentucky, not all that far away. There's some long-range migrants, like the on the right-hand side, you see the yellow-rumped warbler. Uh, they come from uh, the southern United States, like Florida, um, and neotropical migrants, which come from Central America, Me Mexico, Central America, and some as far away as South America. Uh, so, what is migration and why do birds migrate? Well, first question is what is migration? And it's usually to pass periodically from one region or climate to another for feeding or breeding. That's a very simple definition, but there's more to it than that. Uh, in the 1700s, a German farmer and amateur naturalist by the name of Johann Andreas Naumann uh, realized he had some birds that he kept uh, in, in a cage that he would study. And he realized that in the spring, the birds would get unusually restless and they would kind of bounce off the side of the cage that was facing north. And then in fall, they'd get unusually restless again and they would bounce off the side of the cage facing south. It's because these birds had this feeling like they needed to migrate. They needed to move. They were restless and, and they felt this urge. So he created a word. Uh, forgive me if there are German speakers out there. I probably am mispronouncing this improperly, but he created a word called Zugenruhe, uh, which uh, he, he used to describe that restlessness. Uh, he used the word Zug, which is German word for movement, or migration, and he used unruhe, which is the German word that means restless anxiety. As we all know, the birds aren't the only species that migrate. Um, uh, whales, gray rails migrate up the California coast to the Gulf of Alaska to breed. Uh, fish migrate around the Great Lakes to breed. And of course, the, the, think of the amazing wildebeest migration across the savanna of Africa. It's pretty cool. Roseanne, I'm gonna hand this one over to you because you know a lot more about flyways and, and, and paths that birds migrate than I do. Well, I think this is a wonderful map because it shows that here in Michigan, we are uh, privileged to be part of both the Atlantic Flyway and the Mississippi Flyway. And you can see where they cross over in the southern part of the state. So as those birds are moving from the southerly areas up through here, we get the bonus of getting to see more of them than, than maybe many other parts of the country. And these uh, flyway patterns show you where the birds are going to end up and uh, breed at the northernmost extent of these color regions here. Um, this is one of the reasons that the Great Lakes and the health of the Great Lakes are very important. 
and that we have such good, uh, you know, important bird areas such as Lake St. Clair. So the how of migration, nobody really knows for sure why birds migrate. We, we speculate that they do it for young, of course. And um, when you think about birds that, that breed in the tropics, they generally have a, a clutch side of two to three birds. But birds that travel all the way to um, the northern hemisphere, far reaches of northern hemisphere, and return back to Central America or Mexico or South America, uh, they generally have clutch sizes of four to five five birds. So we think that they do it for food, that they're moving from areas with declining resources to areas with increasing resources. And we, we know how many insects there are in places like northern Michigan during the, the summer months. Um, so how do birds know when it's time to move? Again, nobody knows for sure. There's this general restlessness. We think that the birds are, uh, get a sense that it's time to move simply based on the angle of the sun. Um, and that's what sends them off. We also know that birds are very, very sensitive to the weather. Obviously, if you're in the Southern Hemisphere someplace and it's uh, April in Michigan and it's snowing, the birds really don't know what the weather is here when you're you know, in the middle of migration. But when they do arrive, they're sensitive to the weather in that they don't want to fly into uh, a really strong northerly uh, winds. So they will pause for a few days in, in places and wait for that wind to shift and use those winds to push them along. Migration tends to be uh, pretty orderly. First, the short distance migrants arrive. Um, here in southeastern Michigan, we start seeing red-winged blackbirds and common grackles the last couple of days of February, the first couple of days of March. And then the winter birds leave. And when we talk about the winter birds, we're, we're talking about the uh, dark-eyed juncos that are generally in the area. Uh, then the long distance migrants arrive. Those are the birds that come from uh, the southern United States, species like killdeer and the yellow rumped warbler again. We know that most migration happens at night. Uh, we don't really know why. Speculation is, of course, because there are uh, fewer. Um, it's cooler, of course, but there are also fewer raptors, fewer, fewer um, birds that will eat other things that will eat other birds at night. Uh, those migrants are safer. We know that the older males come first and the younger males and females follow. So if you were a bird that was hatched last year, you probably are late to the, the breeding grounds and you get to the breeding grounds and you say, oh man, all the best places are taken because those old guys beat me to it. There's something to be said for experience. And we know that it's time to coincide with other events. And we'll talk about that in a couple of different places along the way. So how far do birds fly? Well, some only fly a few hundred miles, common grackles and red-winged blackbirds. Some fly thousands of miles all the way from South America. Some fly 500 miles or more across the Gulf of Mexico nonstop. Think of the, the ruby-throated hummingbird. It will jump off the coast of the Yucatan Peninsula and fly nonstop across the Gulf of Mexico. This bird is so tiny, and yet it can fly 500 miles nonstop. Some birds fly from New England, South America nonstop in the fall. I'm, I'm thinking specifically of the, the black pole warbler, which just amazes me that, you know, we're talking a couple thousand miles nonstop. And some birds may fly 500 miles or more in a single day if they have a great uh, wind pushing them along. Of course, we all know that there's danger along the way. Predators, there, there are, um, uh, you know, animals out there that are ready to eat these migrating birds. They, they could run into storms. They could strike tall buildings, communication towers, wind turbines, and cats. We all know that cats are, are uh, just terrible for birds. Uh, it's estimated that cats kill as many as a billion birds every year. And that terrible picture that you see on the right side of your screen is actually birds on the deck of a cruise ship that was in the um, um, Gulf Stream in the Atlantic Ocean off the coast of Georgia a couple of years ago. Um, the birds were migrating at night. They got confused by the, um, the lights of the ship and they ended up crashing into the ship. Many of the birds, unfortunately, did not make it. So it's a dangerous kind of thing. Uh, Roseanne, I'm going to turn this one over to you since you're the certified bird feeding expert. What do birds need along the way? Well, certainly the more that they can find native plantings, the better 
because native plants produce native insects. And that is exactly the reason why birds are coming to this area so that they can find those insects and feed themselves, uh, replenish the proteins that they've lost and the fats that they've lost and have that uh, food source available for their youngsters. So uh, mature trees are great uh, for them to be able to roost in overnight and to find the insect sources that they need. And um, yeah, the plants that have that vertical structure are gonna be what they're going to see. They're gonna be coming into the bigger trees, looking for the understory as well, because the understory is protective and full of food sources as well. So the, the more natural that you can keep your yard or areas that you can involve the community in, the better for birds. So what have we seen so far? Roseanne, you wanna talk a little bit about what birds we've seen so far in migration? Yep, well, here's that lovely red-winged blackbird. This is the male. And it has one of the most familiar sounds of spring, uh, as my friend described it. It's my tree. The display of the male is a great spectacle to see when they spread their wings and flare their tails and arch their backs to show off their namesake red epaulets, which is the shoulder patch that you see. Now here's the female red-winged blackbird, which can be confusing to new birders. They look very inconspicuous with their overall streakiness, but if you look closely, their beak is the same as the male's, very pointed. Look at the salmon-colored wash on the face face and throat of the female, which is an identifying characteristic. Both the males and the females forage on the ground predominantly for food. I love this picture of the common grackle. Uh, it's beautifully iridescent with a striking yellow eye set against that dark face and a very long and strong looking beak. They arrive in great numbers in the spring and are opportunistic at bird feeders where safflower seed is a good plan to keep them away as that's not what they prefer and they have a difficult time removing that shell. Their display is also quite remarkable. Groups of males will feed together and one will get the urge to show off with its head held high and its wings spread as it gives a loud and harsh guttural sound which only the females of the species can appreciate. This is our earliest arriving shorebird, the killdeer, and it's named for its call. They can often be heard calling at night as they arrive back in Michigan in late March. That is the peak of their migration. They're known for their broken wing display, which is used to lure potential predators away from their nest or their young. Because they nest on the ground, they can often come into conflict with humans who want to use the same spaces, such as playgrounds. This is a wonderful picture of the wood duck. It's so striking that its colors seem to be unbelievable. As Pete Dunn, a very notable birding expert has said, it's a fortunate world in which a bird this beautiful can also be so common and widespread. The pairs choose their mates on their wintering grounds and then migrate back to this area as a couple. Wood ducks nest in tree cavities and will use nest boxes that you place out for them. One of my most memorable sightings of a wood duck was when I was watching a barred owl and it went inside of a tree cavity emerging minutes later with a dead male wood duck in its talons. Red-breasted mergansers are primarily Arctic breeders, which is why they pass through so early. They have a long way to go. This is another bird with an amazing courtship display. The male stretches his neck up and then thrusts it forward, abruptly bowing and then lowering its breast onto the water, opening its bill as if it is gasping for breath and repeating that display several times. The eared grebe is a very cool looking bird with its wispy sprays of yellow feather plumes on the side of its head, crimson red eyes and the chestnut colored flanks. This is a bird that dives for its meals using legs that are set far back on the body as a means of propulsion through the water. These birds have already gone through this area. So they're another early migrant. Lovely picture of an Eastern Phoebe, which is a type of flycatcher, a name given to the family of birds for their habit of catching flying insects in midair, usually from a short flight off of a perch. 
This bird is exhibiting one of the reasons that small dead branches or snags are important in our habitat, allowing birds to survey the air for prey. Phoebes nest almost exclusively on man-made structure. The Phoebe is known characteristically for pumping its tail with an emphatic stroke, often accompanied by fan tail feathers. Here's a male on the left and a female on the right cowbird, brown-headed cowbirds. They were once a native of the prairies, but they've expanded their range as we opened up the eastern forests. Habituated to following bison to eat the insects that were stirred up by the movement of that mammal, the cowbirds didn't spend time in one place, and they adapted their nesting strategies accordingly, dumping their eggs in the nests of other birds. Now that they are widespread, in the eastern United States, this nesting strategy is having a huge impact upon warblers, thrushes, and other species. Cowbird eggs usually hatch first, and the young are lar larger, which crowds out the young of the host species and sometimes scoops them out of the nest. Oops. Yep, great picture of a oh, red-tailed hawk. And even though southeastern Michigan isn't really known for uh, spring migration of hawks, it's one of the best places that you can see fall migration of hawks. This time of year, uh, the red-tailed hawks and Cooper's hawks are already paired up and mating and um, got their young in the nest and taking care of squirrels in the neighborhoods and some of the uh, smaller songbirds um, that the Cooper's hawks feed to their, to their young. Uh, there is a part of Michigan uh, at the Mackinac Straits that is known for red-tailed hawk migration and has, the, has had the highest count of red-tailed hawks during spring migration of anywhere in the United States. This little bird is called a brown creeper and it is aptly named because it creeps along the trunks of trees moving upward in a mannerism that could be called mouse-like. As it moves upward, it spirals around the trunk and then proceeds to fly to the next tree when it reaches branches that stop its climb, starting again at the bottom of the trunk and repeating that pattern. This feeding technique is diagnostic of the brown creeper, which uses that long beak to reach into the crevices of the bark for insects. Their long tail feathers are very stiff to allow the bird to prop itself well against the trees. Well, here's a bird everybody knows, the American robin. Um, robins have a tendency to stay in southeastern Michigan uh, more than they usually did, and this is probably uh, as a result of the type of fruiting trees that we have planted and changes in the weather. Those birds that stay are first here on nesting territory, and so they get the best spots to be able to offer to the females. However, of course, there's always that group of them that migrate south and then return back in great numbers. This little guy is called the golden crowned kinglet, and it's been described as a little dumpling with a tiny bill. And I think that's suitable for this little four inch bird that weighs less than an ounce. Golden crowned kinglets eat insects exclusively and use some interesting feeding techniques, including hovering at the tips of branches and foraging upside down. This bird is often located first by its call, which is a soft CC. The crown feathers are erected when the males are in display mode and show a red patch that's in the middle of the golden crown. This is the ruby crown kinglet, which is a plainer version of its cousin, a bit more hyperactive with more wing, wing flickering as it feeds. Can you tell that it's just like a quarter of an inch longer than that golden crown? The kinglets are birds that we see in migration and not during the summer as they are headed to northern Michigan and further to breed. Great pictures here of blue-gray gnat catchers. They're more slender than warblers and have diagnostic white outer tail feathers, which are noticeable as they swish their tails about. The white eye ring gives them a startled look. Gnat catchers never stop moving as they hop along branches in their search for insects, hovering to pick insects from a branch or dart from the branch to catch a flying insects. Their vocalizations are very wheezy. And now I have to stop and let Bill tell his joke about them. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry to inflict this on you. Um, so, do you know how, did you know that the blue gray gnat catcher is the most efficient bird in the world at catching its prey? Have you ever seen a blue gray gnat? 
<laughs> okay, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Roseanne. Okay. Our next bird, somebody had mentioned that they had in their yard, brown thrasher, a very aptly named bird as it forages on the ground for food, thrashing through leaf litter in search of insects. Thrashers will also eat fruit. Check out the slightly downturned beak and the very long tail, which it holds level as it runs, similar to a roadrunner. Thrashers sing high in the treetops and their song is one of the most enjoyable to our ears, consisting of two and three note phrases each one sung twice with a characteristic pause before the next set. Here's one of my favorites, the turkey vultures. They may not win anything in the beauty department, but they're one of the most beneficial birds that we have. They eat only dead stuff, so they are a great cleanup crew, removing carcasses from our woods and roadsides. They are one of the few birds with a sense of smell, which allows them to find that food. A turkey vulture can be told in flight easily as it holds its wings in a dihedral and has a very tippy flight, not straight and strong like raptors such as eagles and larger hawks that are similar in size. When turkey vultures feel threatened, they projectile vomit toward the approaching threat, so don't walk towards them. <laughs> Here's another early migrant, the hermit thrush. It is our earliest arriving thrush and can be told by its rusty flanks and tail. It's the only thrush that winters in the United States, which means it has less of a distance to migrate and therefore arrives on the breeding grounds first. As you watch its behavior, observe how it quickly raises and lowers its tail, another field mark. Hermit thrushes also habitually rapidly flick their wings as they jerk their tail. They search the leaf litter, litter for insects such as beaters, beetles, caterpillars, bees, ants, wasps, and flies. They do also eat small amphibians and reptiles. This is why it is important to leave the leaves in your yard as opposed to clearing them all away. The Eastern towhee is another early migrant that feeds on the ground in leaf litter, scratching vigorously with their feet to uncover insects and seeds. The tricolored pattern of the species is bold and very distinctive. The female is brown in places where the male is black. Tohees are shy birds and are rarely found far away from the cover of trees or bushes, so think about that when you're landscaping in your yard. The song of the Eastern Tohee has been described as the bird singing, drink your tea. So Bonaparte's gull is the first gull that arrives in the spring. Um, it, it's a migrant on the Great Lakes, of course. Uh, it winters in the southern United States and summers in the boreal forests of Canada. And believe it or not, this guy actually nests in trees. Um, you didn't know that gulls nested in trees, did you? Um, they'll fly past in, in loose groups. And um, when they come back in the, in the fall, they're going to look very, very different. They're going to have a completely white head with just a little black spot behind um, the eye. So perhaps you can find them on inland lakes, including that lake that's right behind uh, the library in Lyon Township. Great blue heron, of course, it's really not that much of a migrant because there are winters when it stays all year in uh, southeastern Michigan. Um, we can find them here as long as there's open water and food for them to eat, but they return in pretty large numbers in early March, and it's familiar to all. Belted kingfisher. Now, most species, in, in most species, the male is more colorful than the female. In the belted kingfisher, it's the opposite. This is the female, and she has that belt across her breast that the male does not have. It's another short district migrant. It'll only go as far south as open water. Um, and it's also like um, a couple of the other species that we've talked about, you're more likely to hear it before you see it because it kind of has this rat-a-tat call uh, that you will hear before likely you see it fly in. Um, they nest along riverbanks and uh, high banks of, of lakes. So they will actually fly into a, a lake bank with their bill and their head and knock, make a hole that goes in about 15 feet in order to build a nest. Uh, it, they're, I think, belted kingfishers are super cool birds. Um, the swallows and purple martins also begin to arrive as the insects come out. 
Um, and they come uh, from Central and South America. First, the tree swallows arrive, and the tree swallows will eat insects, but they will also eat vegetable um, uh, things like fruits. Then the barn swallows and the northern rough wing swallows and the purple martins arrive. Uh, you know how I said that, the, that um, arrival and certain events are timed to insects, uh, to other things? Well, the barn swallows in our neighborhood, we live over in Gross Point, right on Lake St. Clair, and the barn swallows here time the hatch of their young to the hatch of uh, fish flies. So here in, in Lake St. Clair, we have this huge fish fly hatch every year, and they time their, their young emerging from their nests absolutely in time for the fish flies, so they will have plenty to feed them. Barn swallows winter in, in Central and South America, and purple martins winter in South America and nest from the Gulf Coast <laughs> all the way to the northern parts of the Great Lakes. Yellow rumped warbler. Here's one of uh, these birds that, uh, again, it's, they'll eat both vegetables and insects. And uh, this guy is first warbler to arrive in the spring and the last one to leave in the, in the fall because they will eat fruit. Uh, they can digest waxy fruits and berries from poison ivy, wild grapes, and Virginia creepers. Uh, it's a medium to long range migrant. It can nest as far north as, as Florida and Mexico. Uh, my wife's family lives on the east coast of Florida, just south of the Space Center. I swear if you're down there January, February, you shake a tree down there, one of these will fly out. They are everywhere in that area. Baltimore Oriole. Now we're getting into the long range migrants. The, 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 as the spring goes on, uh, more and more uh, arrivals are coming from farther and farther away. Uh, remember that red winged blackbird that we saw first off? Well, this guy is actually in the same family as the red winged blackbird, along with the brown headed cowbird and metal arts. They're all in the family icterids. Uh, they're all icterids. Uh, they got their name because of the orange and black plumage is the same as the crest of the Baltimore family from England. Uh, yes, it's the same family that lent its name to the city. Uh, and you can easily lure this migrant to your yard. We'll talk a little bit about that in a little bit because it loves fruit. Uh, they winter uh, Mexico, Central America, and northernmost South America. And of course, the little dynamo, the ruby-throated hummingbird. They generally find their way into uh, southern Michigan in uh, mid-April. Uh, I generally associate tax day, April 15th, with the day that I need to start putting up my uh, hummingbird feeder in my backyard. Uh, a few will winter in uh, extreme southern Florida, but most winter in southern Mexico and Central America. Um, there are lots of humming, hummingbird species in the western United States, but this is the only hummingbird species that breeds in the eastern United States. Um, yellow warbler. This is a warbler that you, I, I'm willing to bet you can find this warbler behind the, the Lyon Township Public Library because uh, this guy is, is generally associated with water. Uh, it loves uh, small lakes, ponds, and wetlands. And you can hear its song because it sounds like it's singing, sweet, 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 I'm so sweet. Um, this is a bird is a little bit of an oddity because it has a migrant population. It, it winters in Central America and the Caribbean, and it has a migrant population and a resident population. Some birds travel all the way here to North America, and some in the same population stay in their wintering range all year round. And nobody really understands why some birds migrate and some birds don't. Nashville warbler. Um, they have uh, come and they're setting up shop and, and you can find them in northern Michigan. They're breeding right now. Uh, they winter in extreme southern Texas and Mexico uh, to breed in northern Michigan, Wisconsin, and Canada from Manitoba to the Maritime Provinces. Um, it only has a tenuous connection with Nashville. It, it's not like it sings, you know, country songs or anything. Um, it was actually named for the location of where it was discovered and named. So there are a handful of birds out there that are named after where they were discovered. Cape May Warbler, Kentucky Warbler, Tennessee Warbler. Uh, yeah, those are all the same naming um, the way they were named. Um, as opposed to something that like the black and white warbler, which is named for its foliage, um, appropriately named bird if there ever was one. Uh, its wintering grounds are in Florida, Mexico, Central America, and South America. 
Um, most warblers tend to feed at the crown of the trees or out on the tips of the limbs. This guy likes the, the larger limbs and the trunks. So here's a identification tip. If you um, see a warbler or a bird that's actually working its way on the larger limbs or the trunk of the tree, uh, it could be brown creeper like we talked about earlier, or it could be this species, the black and white warbler. American Red Star, what a gorgeous little bird with that black and orange color pattern. Uh, they winter in the Bahamas, Cuba, Central America, and South America, and they breed in large areas of Eastern North America. I had one breeding in a neighbor's yard just two years ago. Um, and you can attract them to your yard in the fall in particular because they like to eat small fruit like service berry. Um, and I don't know if anybody out there is really familiar with bird calls and songs, but if there's a, a song of a bird that you cannot figure out what it is, it's likely an American Red Start because yeah, their song is all over the place. Uh, other thrushes, the, 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 the wood thrush, Swainson's thrush, her, uh, are, they've arrived, they come later than the hermit thrush, which is the first one to arrive. These guys blow me away because they have, they can sing a duet with themselves, believe it or not. We have one larynx, which is our voice box in our throat. These guys have what's called a syrinx. They make sound with a syrinx and they have two of them. And the syrinx is attached in their chest really close to their lungs. So uh, they can control the two different syrinxes with different parts of their brains separately. So when you hear a wood thrush or a veery singing, it's actually singing, harmonizing with itself. It's singing a duet with itself. It's really, really cool. Blackburnian warbler, oh my goodness, is that a gorgeous bird or what? But if you ever see one in real life, you will just drop your jaw to the ground and have trouble picking up your teeth because they are just that gorgeous. The picture does not do it justice. You get one in the sunshine, it's like, oh my goodness, look at that glow of those orange feathers. Um, so these guys winter from Central America and uh, south to Northern South America, and they breed in Northern Michigan, in Southern, in Southern Canada from the Maritimes to Manitoba. Just a gorgeous, gorgeous bird. Eastern wood peewee. They are among the latest migrants to arrive. I had one just last week. They sing for like one week and then they, they hush up and you would never know that they were here. You, you listen for them, you hear a, a uh, sort of a horse, peewee, and that's it. One week and, and they're still here all summer, but you wouldn't know it. Um, they uh, summer here in, in northern Michigan and uh, they breed um, they come all the way from South America. Common nighthawk. Here's a bird that is kind of poorly named actually because it's no longer common. Uh, the numbers are in incredible decline. That we're seeing their numbers in decline all across North America. Uh, it's not a bird that actually flies a lot at night. It's more common to see them as at sunrise and sunset. And it's not a hawk. Other than that, it's perfectly named. Um, these guys love to eat insects. And if you were to see one in flight or hold one in your hand, they have this amazingly large mouth that they use to catch insects on the wing. Eastern Kingbird. I tend to think of this guy as being the bird version of an English banker uh, wearing a white shirt and a gray flannel suit. But these guys are in the flycatcher family along with the peewees and the, and the phoebes. Um, but, you know, as, as plain as this guy looks, if you make him mad, he, he will stick up a crest of feathers on the top of his head that are bright red, which is very, very cool. Uh, the other thing that these guys will do is they will protect their nest from anything that comes nearby, and they will chase off bigger birds, much bigger birds. They're extremely protective of their nest. So if you see a smaller bird with a white breast uh, chasing away a larger bird, you know that there's a kingbird nest somewhere in the area. 
There are migrants that come through our area every year, and we know that they're here, but we rarely see them. And here's an example of one, the yellow-billed cuckoo. Uh, it's a fairly big, large bird. It's about the size of a blue jay, but you would never, ever see it unless you were to catch it uh, flying from tree to tree. And the only way that you would probably know it is by its size and this incredibly long tail. These guys are actually closely related to roadrunners. Um, and um, we know that they're in the area, even though we don't see many of them, because the peregrine falcons in Ann Arbor. Um, Jana Hinshaw, who's uh, former, uh, who's now retired from the University of Michigan Museum of Natural History, she would go out every day at the base of the bell tower to see what the, uh, the peregrine falcons who were nesting at the bell tower were eating, and invariably she would come, come home every day, back to her office every day, with a dead cuckoo. And nobody knew that there were that many cuckoos in Washtenaw County. Morning warbler is another bird that we see that um, that we know is here, but we rarely get to see it. And I think this bird is really cool because it has this gray head and yellowish breast, but that black patch just on the the, the neck uh, makes it look like it's in mourning. So that's how it got its name. Another bird that unless you're really really lucky, you're not going to see. And you never know what you're going to find in migration. My uh, wife and daughters were doing a service project. They were cleaning up a playground in Detroit. And um, my wife calls and says, hey, there's this bird running around in the playground. It looks like it's something out of Dr. Seuss. Can you come over here and take a look at it? And I grab my camera immediately and run out the door. And it turned out that it was a Virginia rail. And it found a place in an alley under some uh, sticks and, and uh, leaves. And it decided to settle down for the night and continue its journey the next morning on its way farther north. He likes living in swampy areas. Well, we know that nesting is underway. Uh, we've, uh, you've probably seen the first robins of the year, of course. Uh, the mallards are successfully nested. Uh, the, the geese are nesting. And we, if you're lucky, you may even begin to see a uh, Eastern screech owl out there. You know, it's those darn kids. They're up all day and they sleep all night. You know, those darn kids. Um, so Roseanne, I'm gonna turn it over to you here. Um, what, do you wanna pause and ask if we, anybody has any questions about uh, any of the birds that they've seen so far? And then we're gonna we turn it over have... to Roseanne. Yeah, we do have questions. Fire away. Okay. So um, the most recent one was Molly, and she wants to know uh, if the red start has a very characteristic underside. Very characteristic underside? Yeah, she said she saw the bottom of a bird once and thinks um, it may have been the red start, possibly. Yeah, it could very well have been. Uh, the, where you see the orange on the male, the female, uh, it, it has yellow. It's sort of a greenish yellow. So yes, absolutely. Very characteristic. You, you can see those uh, yellow tail feathers too. They have, uh, uh, excuse me, orange on the male and, and yellow on the female. So yes, absolutely characteristic. And you see that and you know it's a red start. There's pretty much no other bird that it could be. Roseanne? Yeah, I agree. So, um... Next question is from Rebecca. She has a lot of geese and wants to know how to get rid of them. <laughs> That's, that is a, a, a question that uh, lots of people ask. Um, so Rebecca, do, do me a favor and answer this question for me uh, and we'll answer it later on. But I have a question for you. Um, do you live in an area where there's like a pond or... Um, uh, water, you know, that's standing water that kind of um, has grass all around it. So um, write, the, write the answer, to Katie, and we'll answer it at the end of the uh, program, okay? Okay. Do me a favor, um, describe it a little bit more what, what, where you live. Any other questions, Katie? Oh, yeah. Um, is it possible for you to share the PowerPoint so that any of our attendees um, can have access to it after. Hmm. You're recording this, so. Yeah, you're recording it. Share the recording. We'll yeah. have the recording for sure, yeah. 
Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. We're recording this and we're going to put um, probably tomorrow. I'll um, email all the participants with the link to the recording and um, you'll be able to access it that way. Yeah. It's probably the best idea. Okay. I'm a little hesitant um, to give up my work. <laughs> Understandable. Um, the next question is, um, should you leave your leaves in the yard and uh, not take them up at all? We're going to talk about that in this section. Oh, yes. good. Okay. All right. And then okay. um, last question. Oh, wait. We have two more questions. How long over the summer do hummingbirds stay around? So hummingbirds stay throughout the summer. You don't see them as much when they're nesting because the female is so busy gathering nectar and insects to feed to the babies. And then in August, when all of her two broods have fledged, so she's got probably four young, you start to see them coming more to feeders and to flowers in your yard. Plus you're gonna to start to see the southbound migration. So you're gonna see all of the birds that are coming from further north through your yards. You actually are gonna get more hummingbirds in August and September than you would have gotten in spring because you've got at least double the number, if not quadruple the number of birds that'll be traveling south. Right. And we're gonna talk a little bit about the role, how important it is that birds fatten up for, for migration in a minute too. Yep. Okay, so last question. Um, Leah is saying she lives in the suburbs of Chicago and saw a, to a tohi in March or April. How does she know if it's spotted or eastern? The, the flanks. Um, the, the spotted tohi has spots on the flanks. So let's, let me back up here and see if we can get back to the tohi really, really quickly. Uh, and we're almost there. There it is. So if you see ch the, the black wing, if you see spots on that black wing, white spots, then you know it's a spotted tohi. That's a western bird. So yes, uh, it's possible to see it. Every, one wanders into Michigan, Illinois every now and then. But yeah, it's, it's entirely possible, but it's more likely to see them in the fall than it is in the spring. All right, thank you. We're all caught up. Okay. All right. I think we, next we were gonna be talking about what we can do to get these birds into their yard, into our yards. And again, I'm gonna go back to native plantings. The reason these birds migrate is to find the insect life that's gonna support them through their migration as well as support their young. And so planting native trees, just like we know about monarchs have host plants and they can't get by without those host plants, the same thing is true of uh, birds and the caterpillars that they eat. Um, so migration is, is time to coincide with the emergence of these food sources. We have more moths in Michigan than we do butterflies. And so the moths are laying their, their eggs in the fall on all of these different trees that are, their, um, food so that are the food sources for the young. The eggs emerge into the caterpillar state, which they start uh, eating as the leaves emerge on these trees. And that is the first food source for all of these birds. Um, the best thing that you can possibly plant if you have room for it is an oak tree, it is the native species uh, for, it is the host plant for over 560 different types of caterpillars. Um, of course, you can have supplemental feeding like nectar for hummingbirds, both in a um, feeder that you put out, but then this is a cardinal flower, which is absolutely loved by hummingbirds, another native plant. Native plants produce more nectar than the cultivars. So whenever you have a choice uh, to make that choice. That's why choosing native is better. Uh, and the native plants also attract more insects, again, than the cultivars do. And fruit and flowering trees, very important. You see orioles, uh, they're eating the nectar that's in all of the different flowering trees in the area. Uh, they'll bite at the, at the very base of a flower in order to get the nectar um, inside of them. We can supplement what we do in our yards in the way of a fruit feeder for an Oriole, but they're never going to go to that exclusively. They're always going to eat what they're supposed to, just like any other bird. So here you've got an Oriole eating jelly. That's not going to stop them from eating the natural foods that they're supposed to eat, and they will definitely turn to the insect uh, insects as food sources 
Now, if it gets to be inclement weather, that's a great time to put out live mealworms because not only will it give them the protein, but they'll also take that back to their babies in the nest. So fat is critically important to birds when they're migrating because it provides them with the uh, energy that they need to go across, say, the Gulf of Mexico or jump across the Atlantic, um, Atlantic Ocean, the um, uh, Gulf Stream coming up the co eastern coast of the United States. So what I have here is a, a photo of a bird bander with a, a bird in hand. And what she's doing is she's looking to see how much fat is on the birds. Doesn't hurt them at all. They just take a little Q-tip with a little bit of water and they brush the, the feathers aside in order to look how much fat is under the skin. And if you look closely, you can see that sort of little yellow patch underneath the reddish skin. And that is actually fat. And a bird bander will measure the fat, of course it's subjectively, on a scale of one to five to see how fit the bird is, how prepared it is to, to uh, migrate. If a bird does not have enough fat as it's migrating on a long distance flight, it will begin to, um, uh, metabolize its own internal organs, and then it will be begin to metabolize the, the sugars and proteins in its, um, in, in its muscles. So yeah, it, when it arrives in the, the nesting area, it will not be able to provide for its young that year because it'll be so busy rebuilding its own self after a long, hard migration. So what do you need to um, uh, get started in bird watching, Roseanne? Well, I think one of the most important things that you can rely on is your hearing. So you can always hear the birds before you see them typically, and you can literally uh, use that uh, technique of cupping your hands behind your ears to get to use them as directional finders for which way that you are hearing the bird singing from, which will allow you to be able to see them better. A great pair of binoculars that spend, spend whatever you can because otherwise you'll be like me and I'm on my fourth pair that I've graduated up to. Uh, so invest uh, well when you first get your binoculars, uh, get a good lesson in how to use them and uh, be able to focus on the birds as you get them in your yard. It's great uh, practice to see them in your yard before you go out in the field. Of course, a scope is good if you're gonna go out and do a lot of uh, long distance birding, uh, especially shorebirds and sometimes uh, hawks. Um, you don't need to spend as much money on a scope as the thousand dollars, but it's wonderful if you do get a chance to uh, look through it. And then, of course, field guides. I don't think you can ever own too many field guides. The one that I find that people <clears throat> like the best is by Stan Tekela because it's arranged by color. And the color is really what we glom onto when we first look at a bird. So, for example, Stan has all the blue birds listed in one section and you just look at the, at the uh, edges of the uh, pages and you go to where they're blue and it starts with the smallest blue bird and works its way up and the same is true of all of the colors. So that's a good way to get to know them and then from there you would wanna do something like go to a Sibley Guide, uh, Birds of Eastern Michigan, which, or Eastern United States, which then breaks them down by family type. And that's where you're gonna get a lot more proficient about what you're looking at. Like we talked a lot today about brushes or um, fly catchers. Right, and at the risk of showing my, my age, uh, I have my Roger Tory Peterson field guide to the bird on my phone. Um, my mother used Roger Tory Peterson when she was at the University of Michigan in 1950 something. And uh, yeah, I inherited that and now I have it on my phone, but uh, that's what I grew up with and, and I'm sticking to it, darn it. So uh, resources, there are lots of great resources on the web for birders, all about birds uh, the, from Cornell Lab of Ornithology is just a, an incredible um, uh, resource for helping you identify birds and also to um, learn more about their habits and their uh, habitat, where they live, how they migrate, etc eBird.org is a website from Cornell that will allow you to store your sightings, but the, the best thing about that is Cornell is going to use the data from your sightings then to monitor bird health across, not only across North America, but around the world. I use birdcast.info from Cornell, which helps to um, predict bird movements in migration. 
Um, migration is kind of petered out now. We've kind of, the birds have kind of all come, arrived yet. So, but in the fall, it'll begin to pick up and it will give you an idea when the birds will be migrating and, and which portions around the country. Um, and of course, the, there's a terrific um, uh, resource in your Wild Birds Unlimited store because they know birds, they know how to talk about birds, they answer your questions. Um, and if you want to, you know, contact Roseanne, please feel free to do that. She's happy to, to be a resource for you. We're using technology to help unlock bird movement and, and more knowledge about birds. Um, this to me just blows me away, forgive me. Um, what you're looking at is a picture of um, radar from Key West, Florida, the night of May uh, 5th, 6th of earlier this year, last month. So when you see that sort of blue ring around Key West, those are actually droplets of water in the sky, but you see sort of a smattering of other colors there. There's kind of a, a coral color and, and a little bit of brown and stuff. Uh, those are actually birds uh, that are moving. But this is uh, about 8, uh, 814 in the evening. So we're gonna put this radar in motion and we're going to watch the birds take off from Key West. Then we're going to watch them take off from Cuba and fly into Florida. There they go from Key West, there they go from Cuba and fly across the Straits of Florida into North America. All those are migrants that, that are being picked up by radar. I think that's just incredible. And we're using radar a lot more, but we're also using other forms of technology like MODIS towers. This was a, a device created by Bird Studies Canada. And what they do is they put a, a small backpack on a bird that will, when a bird flies past a MODIS tower, the MODIS tower will say, oh, here's this bird. It came by at this time. We, we uh, gave this bird this backpack on this day. Uh, we've been able to track it in places X, Y, and Z. So we're, we're beginning to learn more about uh, bird movement through this really cool new technology. So uh, we've kept you here for an hour now. It's time for us to fly. Uh, before we leave, we want to remind you, hey, the governor uh, says that we're no longer required to stay home. So we, we don't have to stay home necessarily, but we do urge you to stay safe, wash your hands. Take, please, please, please continue social distancing. Uh, plant natives, protect the Great Lakes, please, and local ponds. Please limit your use of lawn chemicals and other garden chemicals. So we're here to answer any questions. So um, Rebecca did reply and she said uh, regarding her question about how to get rid of geese, she said that there's grass banks, reeds around the pond near her, and swans usually keep the geese down but hasn't this year. Right. So uh, unfortunately, what we're doing unintentionally is we're laying out the welcome mat for Canada geese. Uh, we have a pond. We have this lovely uh, lawn that we've put out for them. Uh, we continue to pour nitrogen on that lawn. And uh, we're, the, the geese are coming in to eat all that, that lovely grass. So we're just laying out the welcome mat for them. So uh, a couple of things that you can do. One is you can let the lawn grow a little bit higher. Um, you can um, you know, maybe get a trained dog that will chase the geese away. Um, do that before they begin to nest, please. That way you're not, uh, you know, having the, the adults abandon the young. Um, and then um, there are other techniques that you can use, um, like a cutout of a coyote. And you can put that uh, out there, the, the, and, but move it around regularly because if, it, if the birds see this cut out of a coyote, they're going to say, oh, there's a coyote there. Wait a minute, that thing hasn't moved in a week. We know that <laughs> not real. And they'll get habituated to it. It's like those people who put um, a great horned owls on, on the roofs of, of buildings and say, oh, it's supposed to keep the pigeons away. Well, the pigeons learn that it's not real. So yeah, if you're going to do that, you have to keep moving it around so that the, the coyotes will think that it's, it's a, a, a concern. But if you let the grass grow a little bit longer, they don't like the grass long because uh, they want to be able to see around them to, to, to make sure that there aren't any predators nearby. So the, the less they can see, the less likely they are to stay. Thank you for that, Bill. Um, we have a couple comments. I know there's some diehard birders in attendance and one of them 
uh, is Erin, and she was sharing how many of the birds that while you were doing the presentation that she has seen. Um, Lay it on us, Erin. What did you see? <laughs> She she didn't include the she didn't include the list, darn. Uh, really she may have I don't know if she's still here. She didn't, and I don't think she's still on the call. Okay, so like all right. And I did see um, that somebody asked about what flower that was that I mentioned for hummingbirds. The Latin name is Lobelia cardinalis, um, also known as cardinal flower. Right, and a, a great place to get your um, native plants is a place in Mason, Michigan, near Lansing, called Wild Type. Um, and they just they specialize in these uh, great native plants, uh, and so uh, go to their website. You can order from them, and I, I encourage you to you know don't get it from Lowe's, don't get it from Home Depot, get it from them because it's really really important that we have make sure that we plant natives and not something that's a cultivar. So we do have a couple questions about hummingbirds. The first one is do you are local hummingbirds recognize us? And are they territorial because they only seem to be feeding one at a time? They're definitely territorial, especially males, which is why sometimes it's helpful to put up feeders, two different ones out of sight of each other in your yard so that the male can't defend both at the same time, but then you get other hummingbirds at the other um, feeder. Uh, and as to whether or not they recognize us, I don't know. I guess we're going to have to ask them when we get to bird heaven, because I just don't know. <laughs> Do they look for the feeders in the same pla uh, place as last year? Yes, they do. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes, they do. They come okay. back every year to my yard looking for that feeder, and I know that there's a hummingbird out there because he's buzzing around my, my um, um, feeder post out there and my feeder's not out there. And he's like, hey, where is it, buddy? <laughs> so it was Ellen, not Erin. And she is still on the call. So I'm going to unmute her so she can share oh. about the birds that she's seen. Can you, can you talk, Erin, uh, and sure? Uh, yeah, well, my list is downstairs. Just give me 25 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> We do have another question in the meantime. Okay, um, let's go Bill, for it. Bill said he lives in southeastern Michigan. He wants to know, do Orioles go farther north when they leave uh, at the end of this month? Uh, you know, the, the, there's a thing called post-breeding dispersal. And um, so after they're done raising their young and um, getting those, those young out of the nest, they just kind of take off and go wherever. Um, some, some birds will begin to head south immediately uh, in like some of the shorebird species. The, the least um, um, sandpiper will, the females will come south as early as late July uh, and leaving the males to r raise the young. Um, but some of them will just, you know, hang around and just wander for a while. Depends on the species. Yeah. Okay. So we we do have two other questions. Um, do, Aaron, did you mind waiting for just a little bit? I don't mind. Okay. Um, Abby wants to know if wildtypeplants.com is the link for native plants. Yes. Okay. And then Molly asked if you mentioned anything about suet. No, we didn't talk about suet. And I don't find that suet is necessarily a winter only uh, situation. I think that feeding with suet can be a year round activity that you can enjoy as well as that the birds can depend on as a supplement. I have a pair of Johnny Woodpeckers that come every day, and I think it's kind of like the, the parental break. They get to come get a reliable food source, then go back to looking for the insects that they're gonna be feeding to the babies. Um, if you have issues with other birds feeding at suet, then the rendered pure suet is a good um, alternative because it's not as 
desirable to the starlings, which can be very overpowering at a feeding station this time of year. Yeah. All right. We'll make this one the last one. Ellen, what, you, what have you been seeing? Uh, my name's Erin, not Erin. Ellen. Ellen's my mom's computer. This is my mom's computer. I don't have okay. my own computer. All right, Erin. What have you been seeing? Well, this is my big year list. Okay, so I started my big year in Phoenix, Arizona. These are the birds. This would take some time. Gila woodpecker, morning dove, white winged dove, violet green swallow, red bellied woodpecker, gambles, quail, counted solitaire, blue gray gnatcatcher. We may be flicker. here a while. What? We may be here a while. What's your total? Yeah. Uh, 100 and. 30, uh, hang on a second, let me turn a couple of pages. So you started- 136. Nice. nice. So you, started, you started this year, did you get down to Sweetwater um, wetlands in Tucson? Uh, no, I don't think I've ever been to Tucson. Okay, if you're going back to Arizona, you uh, get down to Tucson and go to Sweetwater wetlands. It is the best birding in, in that area. It is just terrific. Well, I'm here in Marquette right now, so. <laughs> That's no excuse. Yeah. Good but stuff in the Upper Peninsula right now, though. Always is. Yep. I've seen two Baltimore Orioles, and I drew this picture. Ooh. Lovely. Yep. It's the only picture of a Baltimore Oriole I've ever drawn. You know, and that's a really great way to, to remember uh, bird, to, 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 you know, get that brain of yours to remember what uh, field marks that birds have. Uh, it's the only way that I got to remember what a white winged dove looked like is by drawing a picture of it. So, yeah, um, that's, that's a really good uh, technique. Actually, I mostly just have to memorize the appearance of the bird. I don't have that many bird calls memorized, but I have a bunch memorized, mostly from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. I also have over 10 field guides, including the Sibley one in the Birds of North America. I have an animal encyclopedia that I've had since I was a fifth grader. I'm in eighth grade right now. I'm almost done with it, and this is my second time doing a big year. Nice. Good for you. Well, Aaron, we don't want to discourage you, but we've been on the call now for more than an hour, and we promised that we would uh, cut it to, uh, you know, keep it right in an hour, and so we've been talking too long, so we're going to say goodbye. That's okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Bill and Roseanne. We really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for making our first virtual presentation a wonderful one. We appreciate it. All right. Anything else? Stop share. Okay, there we go. Oh, that was the there one. were two more questions if you have just a little bit more time. All right, I'm ready. Okay, so Molly wanted to know if you have any tips for making homemade suet. Phew, boy, I don't. Uh, <laughs> I don't, sorry. I, okay. And I, I don't either. My, my, my um, mother used to take bacon fat and um because she she liked the starlings for some reason she used to take bacon fat and and old stale um uh bread and chop up the bread and mix it with the bacon fat and put it out for the starlings but uh other than that no i i really don't and then the last question was from pat uh wanted to know what the name of the nursery was it's wild, wild type okay Wild uh, it's on, yep, it's on uh, North Every Road in Mason. All right. All right, thank you guys so much. We really appreciate you taking the time to, to share all this wonderful information about birding with us and the migratory patterns. This is and, amazing. And Susan, yes, the indigo bunting is a, migrate, is a migrant. Yes, comes from uh, South America and Cuba and places like that. All right, I'll shut up now. <laughs> All right, everybody. Thank you so much for attending. You guys have a wonderful night. Thank you. Bye-bye now. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>
And also thanks for your patience earlier. I appreciate that. No problem. I've had to wait way longer for things in school. Bye. <laughs>